Hey everyone, welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I think a lot of you know that I've been mentoring coaches lately, and I've had an incredible opportunity to work as a coach, as a trainer uh, for over 20 years and studied really extensively. The reason I tell you this is because it's so important to acknowledge that your body, um, whether you're aware of it or not, is a perfect representation of what's going on inside your body. So the external expression of your body, which includes the way you move, uh, your body composition, your muscle tension, is a very good indicator as to what's going on inside of your body. And uh, there's a great book called The Body Keeps the Score, which goes deeply into this. And um, it's really probably unconsciously known to all of us. You look at someone, you can see the tension. You know, you look at someone, you can see them very relaxed. It's an, it all exists at an unconscious level. But someone, so few of us pay attention to it. I'd like for you to start paying attention to it. And today's guest is going to give you a pathway to start paying attention to it. So how do you hold your tension? How do you move? Do you have tight muscles? Do you have a hard time accessing range of motion when you train? All these things are an indication of what's happening at the level of the autonomic nervous system. Are you hyper aroused all the time and hypertonic, meaning hyper amounts of tone? Or are you someone that's relatively fluid and relatively relaxed and calm? This is so important when it comes to your health. Imagine what's happening at the level of the muscle. If your muscles are always hypertonic, they're always super contracted. Your blood vessels have to constrict or they're being constricted. Your blood pressure has to go up to compensate and get nutrients into the blood or into the tissue. It's a big concern. Today's guest, Lisa Wimberger, is the creator of NeuroSculpting, a five-step meditation process that can help you relieve stress. A lot of the stuff is deeply embedded trauma that we literally hold in different places of our body. And this, there's so many incredible books on this now. And uh, I think everyone has some in trauma embedded, which is why things like yoga and Pilates and meditation practices have become such a strong, powerful expression of uh, connection between body and mind since the beginning of the human species. Because ultimately, we all have these issues and we all look to resolve them. So Lisa is an absolute wealth of information. She grew up meditating, uh, which is super cool. And interestingly enough, she got hit by lightning as a teenager, uh, which induced seizures and sent her down this path of trying to figure out how she was going to not have seizures anymore. She needed to gain control of her mind. She needed to gain control of her nervous system. And she tells us exactly how she did it and exactly how we can do it for ourselves. Absolutely love this conversation with Lisa. She's based out in Colorado. If anyone's in that area, you guys can head over and see her. If not, she's got an incredible website that she tells you all about on the podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Real Mushrooms. You guys know I've been an advocate of mushrooms for a long time, and I finally found the greatest source of mushrooms that I can find anywhere. There is a difference in the quality of mushrooms, and I will tell you that we did record a podcast with the gentleman who is the creator of Real Mushrooms, and he's going to come on and tell you guys all about the difference between uh, some of these mushrooms grown in America that are grown on mycelium, which ultimately is grain or oats. And a lot of times the grain and the oats ends up being the bulk of the weight of the mushrooms. And that's a big, big problem. We actually want the mushrooms for the positive benefits. And unfortunately, yes, it is legal for them to call the mycelium mushrooms, even though they're not, and it's not, doesn't have the active ingredients. But again, I'm not going to talk about that now. I just want you guys to know that the quality of your mushrooms matters. And the difference you're going to feel when you try incredibly high quality mushrooms is nothing short of tremendous. You guys know I use lion's mane. I actually use a lot of lion's mane now. I've increased my dosage a lot um, because I'm going through some um, protocols to try to heal some previous damage I've, I've had to my brain from trauma as a child. But anyways, head over to realmushrooms.com slash Ben and get hooked up with 30% off your first order and use the code Ben and you can get Anything site-wide at an incredible discount of 30% off. This is incredibly generous uh, of them to offer this. And this is, as you know, not very common in the supplement industry. So um, head over there now and get hooked up. Pick up some lion's mane, pick up some reishi. I'd also suggest you pick up some cordyceps because I'm doing a really cool uh, 
experiment right now. And the cordyceps seems to be doing tremendous things to my blood flow, to my aerobic capacity, and my pumps are out of this world, guys. I hope you enjoy this podcast with Lisa Wimberger. Lisa, how are you today? Fantastic. Happy to be here. And you are fantastic. I can see you radiating a smile and love from your heart. So thank you very much for being here. Yeah. Um, Tell us what what neurosculpting is. Just let's start with the foundation of um, I'll get into all your history and all like that, but I'm very curious what neurosculpting is. It's a very um, compelling term. Yeah. Um, succinctly, it's a five-step meditation process. So the meditation itself has a five-step framework. So um, there's a structure to it, and it's generally a guided meditation form. And its design is to optimize and strategize the brain's natural neuroplasticity while at the same time getting the sympathetic arousal or the parasympathetic freeze into a more regulated space so that the nervous system is much more pliable so that you can very targetedly go in in a meditation and adjust patterns, neurological patterns, um, edit content versus the kind of meditation that I was trained in most of my life, which is very much, I just witness. I witness and I let go. That is, that's kind of the meditation, the transcendental yeah. forms that I was trained in. Whereas neurosculpting is guided meditation, but it's not necessarily I witness and I let go. It's more with this framework. I witness, I take agency over what I witness. I shift my body's relationship to what I witness. And then I do something um, more beneficial for myself with what I'm witnessing and I anchor that in. So it's got a, it's got a regimented structure, but it's very playful and it's very whimsical and it's amazing for deep stress and trauma. We have a lot of trauma clients. So it's based on the premise of, you know, that we store our traumas in some way in our body, in our nervous system, and we're, we're accessing that and in some way changing it. Absolutely. Every single thing is has a, a representation and an expression through the body, whether it's something so subtle that we never, ever notice it, or it's something overt, like, you know, my inflammation is through the roof because of my stress or, or whatever. The body and the mind are on, they're inside of one spectrum. It's the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system spectrum. So there's really no siloing those things and then still being holistically healthy. They have to talk. And, um, and in my previous meditation training, I wasn't talking to my body at all. I was very dissociated from my body. I wasn't, um, the only time I was ever in my body was when I danced and, and I had to slam into my body to feel it. Otherwise I was often very dissociative kinds of meditation or thought practices that allowed me to not feel pain, um, that allowed me to not recognize what the body was telling me and not even know how to use it properly. I was so dysregulated. It was unbelievable. So you've created a framework that you believe or you've proven can actually allow us to access our body in a greater way. So like, this is why this is speaking my language, right? So as, as someone who's teaching, you know, what we'll call intelligent muscle building, I'm the world's greatest advocate of like using exercise as your vehicle to connect with everything in your body. So this internal perspective of exercise rather than external, which most people are, which is why it sounds like we, you and I have this beautiful synergy. So I'd love to hear how we can help my audience access an understanding and a feeling of what's going on inside the nervous system. Yeah. And I think you do it really well. I was just... Um... I was watching this past week your the bodybuilding yogi part two part series um, that you talked about with London Real and everything you were saying. I'm going wait wait I say that wait I say that. So your audience I'm sure is very educated because of the of what you deliver to them in in their nervous system. But most people aren't. Most people have no idea that um, that the gut and the muscles, and even our sense of how we move and proprioception and how we stand and how we posture and our facial expressions are all doorways in to what's happening at the nervous system level, central and peripheral, but even much more subconsciously, those are all doorways into what is happening with our belief systems and with the 
automated default behaviors and patterns we've created in the mind that drive all of it. And we live on this spectrum and we think so much in this world that we're either all the way over here or we have to be all the way over here. And the in-between is where all the magic happens. And we're not supposed to be in any fixed state. We're not supposed to be just body oriented. We're not supposed to be just working on the mind. We're not supposed to be just joyful or, or, or stuck in sadness. I mean, everything is a fluid, unfixed state. And as soon as we start accepting that, we can start listening and hearing the body. I think for people, it's scary. It's scary to listen to what the body is telling them because the body is usually telling you when the body draws your awareness, it's usually because it's out of balance. And if we recognize we're out of balance and, oh, we have to do something about it. Uh Oh, not going there. So we may ignore it. Or if the body is saying something to us uh, about its dysregulation, we may have to look at a painful emotional event that relates to that and we may not be ready. So we're so good at ignoring the body Um, because it usually means a little bit of hard, uncomfortable work. We're not happy with discomfort because we're not trained that discomfort is just an invitation to refinement and and so we don't listen to the body and then you know there's great teachers like Bessel van der Kock who who wrote the body keeps the score which is all about it's all right here it's all right here and it's all on your face it's all over your face I mean my clients walk in and I look at their face and I already know the meditations I want to give them before they even tell me what's wrong it's funny because as soon as you started saying this stuff, I was like, I bet you're just reading people every single posture, the way they breathe, the way they stand, the way their face looks, because it says everything that about what's going on inside their body. It says everything, the lines of the face, the asymmetry that's come from either an asymmetrical snarl or the frown lines or the look of consternation on someone's face that's etched in there. And and all of it, I, I know you've also talked about uh you know, parasympathetic engagement, but all of that from a polyvagal perspective Mm -hmm. is profound indicators and it's profound ways to condition the nervous system. And we're we're not paying attention to it. And a whole other side topic is now we're Botoxing it out. We're freezing these amazing portals into the most primitive aspect of our nervous system, which is facial muscle and, or we're overworking the body, Um, you know, and turning off the mind, you know, you were, you were talking about in that interview, how the old way of exercising in the gym was, it doesn't matter what your mindset is. You know, you put your headphones on, you pull your hat down and maybe it's even angry. Um, And we're separating the body state from the mind state as, as though we're going to be successful doing that. Well, that's not. So anyway, this is, this yes. This is a very atypical conversation. I've never heard anyone in the whole world talking about this stuff. Tell me about how you landed on this. So there's a lot of things that are going in, a lot of pieces to this puzzle that you've put together to come up with what seems like a really interesting uh, modality solution, however you want to uh, call it. Uh, it sounds Fascinating. So I'm very curious to hear your path to this. Obviously, you spoke a little bit about your path in meditation, but there's obviously a tremendous amount of of neuroscience in there as well. Yeah. So the path was very self-serving, coming from my own dysregulation, which I think sometimes all of our most important work comes from us having to do the work. Um, I love theory. I love education. But without application, it means nothing to me. Um, So I grew up strangely meditating. I don't know. I don't know why I had an older brother who taught me self hypnosis when I was 12. And it was just the thing that made sense to me. Um, And I was always a child who defaulted to freeze. I would go very, very quiet, very rigid if I were in trouble. So I was naturally very parasympathetic oriented. Um, And then when I was 15 on my birthday, I got hit by lightning in the base of the spine and everything changed. I started having blackouts that summer, um, having no idea what was happening to me, started having uh, seizures, which I also didn't know I was having. Um, I was having seizures out out in public with friends. 
um, you know, doctors told me I was, um, this was the eighties. The doctor told me that my seizures were because I was um, hormonal and prepubescent. So that was my diagnosis. Um, but the seizures got worse and worse. Long story short, by the time I was in my early thirties, I was having uh, grand mal vasovagal seizures where I'd go into, my heart would stop, my brain would turn off and I'd have to be resuscitated. And I wasn't epileptic. So fortuitously uh, in a doctor's office, um, in a gynecological exam, which is the most vulnerable place, vulnerable place you could ever have a seizure, I had one and I woke up to this gift, this diagnosis, because what I what happened was I woke up to this doctor with a needle of atropine in his hand. His hand was shaking like he had the needle like that. And it was that scene out of Pulp Fiction. And he said, you flatlined. I, I was about to resuscitate you. And he said, has this happened to you before? And, and of course this has been happening to me since I was 15, I had no idea what it was. Um, so that was the moment of diagnosis. They told me after testing me that I had a very hypervigilant parasympathetic response. My vagus nerve was just out of control, could not handle stress. And instead where most people would go fight flea direction, I would go, in Stephen Porges archetypal extreme freeze, I'd be doing the play dead option. And of course with neuroplasticity, the more you do anything, the better you get at it. So I was getting better and better at playing dead to the point where the seizures were, they were life threatening. I was not recalibrating from them. I was in bed for days after a seizure. Um, fortunately, I the last few were in public. So I, so paramedics could come. If they were not in public, I don't, I don't know. And so my brain said, I'm, I'm gonna die. This is gonna kill me. And I'm too smart for this. I'm too smart to let an autonomic subconscious response to stress kill me. I've been meditating my whole life. I studied four years with a Shia monks. I'm trained in transcendental. I am trained in self-hypnosis. I'm trained in all these things, yet I have a stress disorder. So the light bulb went off. I don't know my body and I've been using those things as a drug. And you talk about using the gym sometimes and exercise as a drug. I was using meditation as an escape. I was not using it to process my stories, my body, my stress, my fear. Um, and so I kind of walked away from meditation at that time. And I said, well, I need to understand my brain. I need to understand cranial nerve 10, which is, short circuiting my heart and my reticular activating system because otherwise I'm dead. So that's what I did. I went to study neuroscience. It was very self-serving. Um, I wasn't interested in getting a degree. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I took every course I could get my hands on. So I have certificates and a whole bunch of things, medical neuroscience with Duke, neurobiology with the University of Chicago, all of these classes to understand me and save my life because at the time, my worst last seizure, I, you know, I had a, my daughter was two and a half sleeping in the crib upstairs. And I'm thinking she's going to end up without a mother. And I was a single mother at the time. And I was like, this cannot happen. So studying neuroplasticity in the brain and the nervous system gave me all of the um, insight I needed to go backwards, engineer my meditation practice and refine it into very methodical, structure and at each juncture from step one to two to three, all the way to step five, every step was a way for your thoughts to harness uh, um, an influence over the brain's stress response or the brain's capacity for neuroplasticity. And I didn't know if any of this would work. I was desperate. And so I felt like this would work and I was using myself as my own guinea pig and meditating with this five-step process. And in the middle of it, the content I was meditating on was my response to stress and my response to a seizure halo. And I was practicing much like sports psychology has you run through the play over and over again. I was doing that inside of this framework 
practicing responding to a, a seizure halo with a different response. A seizure halo for me was like this, my stomach would drop out and I'd get a, a minute, a, like a little brief tachycardia, and then it would go into just profound bradycardia. So that was what the, the halo was. So I'd have that feeling and I would evoke that feeling in my meditation and practice responding differently to it, having no idea if it would work. And then after about eight months of practicing with this process, I got a seizure halo in real time. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to die. This is it. And the script and the play that I was practicing for eight months just kicked in on autopilot, like literally exactly how I had practiced it, which was I'm not going to seize. I'm going to punch, kick, scream, fight, bite, yell. And that's what my body did instead of going in the freeze direction. And I moved through this. I never had the seizure. I moved through it and went into this profound neurogenic tremoring, uncontrollable tremoring for like five hours. And I just at the time had my boyfriend put me in a dark room. I just didn't want to see anybody. And I just shook and shook and shook. And when it was all done, I knew it was gone. I knew the seizures were gone an old trauma pattern came out during the shaking that I became conscious of that had maybe had been there the whole time. I don't know. And I just felt victorious. I was, I was a mess, but I felt like this five-step process I was practicing. Oh, oh my God, it worked. Thank God it worked because I was practicing it as my last resort, but it worked and I didn't have a seizure and I repatterned an autonomic response now what? And at that point, I um, quit my job. I was a project manager in the corporate world. And I quit my job. And I said, I need to bring these practices to the world because they saved my life. And I started doing that with no strategy, no money, no credibility, other than 1000% unshakable faith. And me as the litmus test, which is all I needed to be able to go into, because my first audience was law enforcement. I still, I'm, I'm a specialist in law enforcement and help them with their trauma. But to enable me to go in and, you know, be in front of an audience who wants to medically poke holes in the process, theoretically poke holes in the process, um, ding me because I'm not a PhD in this, that, or the other. I can take all of that because there's this, I got rid of my seizures. And for people who are ready to have what I have to offer, I can change their lives. And for people who are not ready to have it, that's okay. You'll, you'll, you'll find something else. Do you so, think it, it's necessary that someone has a deep level trauma or is it, can it be the little stuff you're talking about? You see these little manifestations in people's face and their body. Um, so there's obviously a huge spectrum of, of what exists inside the body. So you had this, this tremendous experience with some, with something that's very traumatic that was very easy to identify the trigger. You're like, okay, I can feel this coming. Yeah. You could reproduce it in your brain in meditation. That's very, you, you could bring it back up. Yeah. For someone who's unaware of their body and someone who, doesn't even know what the trauma is or what it feels like in their body or where it exists in their body. How do we start exploring that? Yeah. Um, it's for all levels. Uh, the, the, the thing that we like to do is teach people first how to understand their nervous system and what it does so they can start becoming aware of those very subtle, quiet indicators. And then inside of the, the meditations, we guide people to um, ask their creative mind, their subconscious mind to uh, bring up a particular concept. It doesn't even have to be a story or a belief. It could be a concept of um, distrust. And we have them play with that concept and see where their body starts responding to just the concept, which may then lead them to, I don't know what's there specifically, but when you're asking me to play with the concept of distrust, I get tight right here. Huh? So you don't even have to know what or why, and it doesn't have to be a trauma with a capital T. It can be stress. It can be a quiet pattern that has not even yet manifested as a full stress response, but is putting you into micro contraction or micro freeze or 
agitating you just a little bit that if you get quiet enough to look, you might see. And so it's it's for all layers of stress. Do you have a process you go through to like, say I walk into your office right now and I say, Lisa, I don't know what's wrong, something's wrong. Uh, I wanna feel better, I want everything to feel better. Yeah. How do you identify the, the most glaring opportunity? Yeah, I usually let, um, because I'm not a therapist, so I don't have a means to diagnose, I usually let the client guide me. So I will say, okay, tell me what your physical um, pain points are. Tell me, describe yourself as a person when you are in those physical manifestations. And then describe me as a person um, not in physical distress out in the world. So I let them tell me the words, the descriptors, and all of that. And I, I kind of list it all. And then I will extract it and say back to them, here's what I heard. I heard gut dysregulation, bowel dysregulation, shoulder pain. And I heard you describe yourself as short-tempered, distrustful, doubtful. Okay. Of those things, what's the biggest, most important one that stands out? And we start there. So it's never me diagnosing them. It's always me saying, where do you want to start? What ends up happening is um, we will derive neuro, um, neurosculpting meditations for these people based on their specific content. We'll guide them through. And then what ends up happening is once they start diving into the content, when we talk about the meditation afterwards, they'll say, whoa, these images came up. These memories came up. I didn't expect. And I'll say, well, are those memories and patterns, things that you want to address as well. And if they say yes, then we start going in that direction. So it's always, always student client driven. Some people want the how and why. So we educate them on neurophysiology, stress response, vagal toning, somatic conditioning for the nervous system, some people don't want the how and why, they just want the meditation practice. And so we usually just meet them where they're at. And when, when we teach classes, it's generally a combo. I want people to know how to understand what fight, flee, and freeze feels like. I want people to understand that you have your hands on the steering wheel and here's how. And then I want people to have a takeaway experience. But um, my clients dictate how I work with them. So if we were to evoke the process and somebody comes in and says, Lisa, I've got this issue. I want to work on exactly this one. Are you able to start walking us through the five steps? Yes. Yeah. So the five steps are this. Step one is we have to let the brain marinate in all of the ways it feels comfortable, safe, or that the environment is familiar or predictable or that there's some semblance of support. So the fight or flight center, right? Midbrain, I'm, I'm gonna pull my brain out here. Uh -oh. I, I always have my brain with me. Okay. So we're gonna look at the right, the inside of the right hemisphere. Generally speaking, when we're in a negative default pattern, a fear-based pattern, a contraction pattern, we're gonna have dominant activity here in the middle of the brain, limbic center, amygdala, hippocampus, thalamus, hypothalamus, and then, um, down here in the brainstem, the pons, which is the freeze response. So life, dangerous, bad, scary, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, whatever your story is, is generally going ding, 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 right here. And this activation is causing me to do either a, a movement towards freeze or a movement towards fight, flee. Either way, we're being pulled out of our higher level capacity. We're going into a default mode. And that default mode, um, is now hypervigilantly looking in the world around it to make sure I'm safe. That's the only way it's gonna stop. So step one of neurosculpting is we have to go right here and feed this part of the brain a checklist. You're safe right now. How am I safe? Um, I'm sitting on a chair that's supported by the solid ground. I know where the bathroom is. I'm hydrated. My temperature is regulated. Okay, all right. I start checking off basic survival needs. Step one, we marinate in giving the midbrain its orientation to safety, predictability, and comfort. However we can. I think there's there's a lot of power in what you just said there because 
uh, again, I don't know if you teach this, but something comes up in my brain. It's like any time a stressful situation comes up, going through that checklist in your brain seems like the most empowering way to just be like, okay, I'm okay. And I teach this to my to my dietary clients, like when they feel that hunger response and the alarm bells start to go off. I just want you to go into your mind and realize if I didn't eat for the next three days, I'm still going to be okay. Yeah. So your brain goes, oh, okay, I'm okay. Yeah. Right? yeah. Quieting midbrain is gold. It's gold. This was always missing for me in meditation. I mean, I studied with monks. Never, ever did they ask me to orient to my environment and know that I'm safe. Instead, I sat down and they started saying, breathe in and out and let it go. And if you're right here, you're not letting anything go. Right. You're just going to stew on what you can't let go. And then you're going to get more mad at yourself. Right. So step one in neurosculpting is a two to three minute marination on any means to identify safety, comfort, or predictability. That's it. And what happens at that point is you orient to it and your midbrain says, I guess I don't need to do so much work right now. I can start to relax. So midbrain activity starts to come down, which means I start to move in a direction towards homeostasis. I may not get there, but I'm going to start orienting towards that, which then leads to step two, which is we want to boost activity in the front of the brain. So step two is optimize the prefrontal cortex. Why? Well, because number one, if we shunt blood oxygen and glucose to the prefrontal cortex, we're, we're doing a better job of keeping it out of the limbic center. So it's like two ends of a seesaw. We're kind of pushing probability in the direction of prefrontal activity. But why else is that important? Well, because during heightened states of learning, uh, the prefrontal cortex can reach a nice sweet spot where we're optimizing focused attention. Midbrain can do that too through fear, but we already calmed that down. So now we want to optimize learning through an induced prefrontal activity. And we'll have a little bit more access to the things that meditation has wanted us to access, like witness mode, which has been measured in monks to happen here, dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, um, non-judgment, creativity, solutions, problem solving, inspiration, all of these things correlate to active prefrontal cortex. So step two is let's activate this. And there's a separate checklist for that one, another one to two minute checklist. And that is give the prefrontal cortex anything it responds to. It responds to novelty, curiosity, humor, and wonder. So the Back pocket checklist for the limbic brain is safety, predictability, comfort. The back pocket checklist for the prefrontal cortex is anything bizarre and ridiculous as long as it is safe and benign. For instance, we may guide in the meditation to imagine that you walk around for the rest of the day with a clown nose on and how, would you, how seriously could you take yourself? We might invite you to imagine what it would be like to speak another language. What would it be like to count in 2.7s? We're throwing random, meaningless, bizarre nonsense that is super creative to the front of the brain. So we've got this quieting checklist, this activating checklist. So these first two steps are an induction. They literally take four minutes. You can do it yourself or you can be guided through it. But once you have shifted resources in the brain towards prefrontal activity and quieted limbic, your nervous system is far more on your side than it was before. It is ready and willing to look at an old pattern and adapt it because you've just assured it it has the safety and the resources to do so. I can't promise it will. But I can promise you, if you don't induce your brain in that dynamic steering, um, you're definitely not going to feel safe enough to change a pattern. So really what we're doing in that in two-step induction is we're skewing probability in the favor of positive self-directed neuroplasticity. Now we're induced. Those two steps all by themselves can, are game changers. I mean, they've changed my life. 
and they can really help your body poise itself for something different. But we can take advantage and harness this boosted plasticity state. And so step three is what is the thought, the belief, the concept, the pattern that we want to look at? So we have two choices in step three. We entertain and look at an old pattern that we're familiar with that doesn't work for us, might be painful. Or we're poised and induced, let's go create something brand new, a brand new mind state, either or, or both. So it's, it's choreography. We either unchoreograph something that we've been doing wrong or no longer serving us, or we choreograph something new in step three. So step three is where the content comes in. So for some of my clients, let's say they come in and they want to work on their I'll pick distrust again. They might be in a distrustful belief system. And so their relationships fail and they want to work on that. It's not a trauma. It's just a stress. So in step three, we bring to mind either a memory of that distrust or even a constructed artifice of what distrust might look like in a scenario. And then we guide them to where their body is hijacked around that thought. But step three is very particular in neurosculpting. Step three runs the risk, if we're looking at a negative pattern, step three runs the risk of pulling someone into it and having them relive it. We do not play that game in neurosculpting. That's just too dangerous. So we make sure to keep people out of viscerally reliving a bad memory. And we do that through bilateral stimulation. So that means we are going to make sure they engage left and right hemispheres in a back and forth toggle because all patterns are generally come with some sort of lateralized uh, framework, lateralized pattern. And we don't know what that is. So we want to make sure that we keep them out of getting stuck in either left lateral or right lateral. So we do a toggle. Now, how do we do that? It's super easy. We, in the meditation, we spell words, we list numbers, we give concrete um, suggestions for imagery. So we might, we might ask you to look at your D-I-S-T-R-U-S-T and your left brain language centers are getting very activated at that part. And then we're gonna ask you to imagine your D-I-S-T-R-U-S-T -S -S as a color, a texture. If it could have a scent, what would it smell like? So we're using language to toggle across the midline to preserve enough safety for someone to actually peek at their old pattern and go find it in their body without feeling like it just sucked me back in. Um, this bilateral stimulation is used in a lot of other modalities. I know EMDR uses bilateral stimulation. And truly, for your audience who's very educated in their body, you know you have to cross the midline of the body to counterbalance, to balance, to brace, to move. Everything is a counterbalance across the midline somatically. But that's true for the brain as well. Additionally, bilateral stimulation increases neuroplastic engagement. So we're optimizing at every step. It's like if we could put every step on supercharge, that's what we're doing with this. While we're looking safely or while we're creating something new with plausibility. And then when we ask the person in step four to go find it in their body, we create an anchor. There's an anchor motion that happens and it's up to the client, but we will ask them once they find this thing, this pattern in their body, maybe they find it, it correlates to tightness in their shoulder. We ask them to breathe into it. We might ask them to move. We might ask them to allow some twitches to happen. When they perceive a shift has happened, no matter how small, that's when we ask them to anchor into that shift because they made that happen. So we'll invite them to make a hand gesture or place their hand on that part of the body, some kind of somatic anchoring because we need to use the body in meditation versus the kind of transcendental, which is you don't feel your body anymore. So with us, it's always, nope, you're in your body. What's your body doing? Can you feel it? Can you adjust it? Can you watch it? Can you anchor into it? So step four is anchoring into the body. 
Step five is uh, giving it a name, naming this new experience, this new pattern, this new script you just laid out for yourself. Um, because then when that word comes up throughout your day, your subconscious is going to go, oh yeah, that was, that was that story where I actually softened the tension and moved a little bit out of distrust. Or when you put your hand on that part of your body, you're going to have a subtle exercise recall in the subconscious mind. So everything we do in this five-step process is a sandbox container designed to optimize the content, keep you as safe as possible, um, and orient you to a mind-body connection and then give you a capacity to find ways back into that content in your day-to-day. -day. And you talk about that too with... I think you said when you, your your cue for your avatar was when you jingle your keys at the front door, right? Mm -hmm. that's, it, that's exactly step three and steps three and four. The story is who do I want to be when I go in this house? And step four, the somatic cue is I'm putting my keys in the door. It's time to turn on that avatar, right? It's 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 the same thing, um, and a, and a lot of these concepts are are pulled from neuroscience. So they're out there. I just put them in a sequence that I never had in meditation or any other practice. And they just blew my mind open and gave me agency over a lot. So when you speak of um, these last two phases, I, from my perspective, those are most vague right now. I'd love to just dive into them a little bit more. So putting my, my hand on, on that spot it, and how is that going to help me going forward? So is it when I experience that emotion, I actually will go ahead and touch that and feel it relaxing and feel it softening. And then the, the purpose of the name, and when you say a name, is it a person's name? Is it, uh, you know, what is the, uh, I just want to kind of draw yeah. the like, yeah. title, title together. So let's just take a little step back and talk briefly about Hebb's Law of Neuroplasticity, which is like the cornerstone of Pavlovian training. Mm -hmm. Neural networks that fire together, wire together. So what does it mean for neural network to fire together? If I'm smelling something, the smell of oranges, I have olfactory networks firing. Mm -hmm. If at the same time, I snap my fingers, right? I have somatic and motor networks firing. Yeah. If they fire at the same time once, Maybe they're not so connected. But if I happen to do that three, four, eight, ten times, then those networks of motor sensory snapping and olfactory smelling orange start to go grow dendritic branches towards each other and connect, meaning I can use one stimulus to trigger a response on the other side of that network now. So we use Hebb's law. So if your mind has just shifted your perception and believed, however microdosed it was, that your body also shifted as well because you, you breathed into it or whatever, you have a perceptual firing. We wanna link that perceptual firing to something like a hand gesture. So that hand gesture and the perceptual firing now equal the same thing. This takes a couple repetitions. So it doesn't mean after the first meditation, you're gonna be able to do this and everything's fine. But what it means is after a few times in the meditation process of linking that gesture to that shift, then they become activating for each other. So then what you can do throughout the day is if you feel your pattern coming up, you can make that hand gesture and your mind starts to move towards the experience you had of releasing that pattern. So you may find that that hand gesture actually does physically shift your body. You may also just practice the hand gesture throughout the day, not waiting for your pattern to come up, but you may just practice putting your hand there and taking a moment to say the name you gave your meditation. The name could the name is arbitrary. It could be the name of a person. It could be the name of a thing, it could be a made up word, but we've got a linguistic cue. We've got a felt sense cue. You can also in steps four and five put in 
other triggers. If you have your favorite essential oil. That's what I was going to say. It yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And smell is super powerful wiring. Um, we don't use it in person because everyone's so sensitive to what they like. But if you know the scent that works for you, put it on your wrist. And at that point in the meditation where you've created a shift to the story and your body's on board with it, even a little bit, smell that oil and give that smell a word or a name. The more external cues you can link to a perception that you had agency over and it's better for you, the more ways you have to exercise that thing. Like, you know, going to the gym, you're not going to use the exact same exercise for that one muscle for 20 years. You're going to have to come to that muscle with a well-rounded approach. And it's the same with linking. So you can use one gesture or you can start meta adding other um, cues and anchors. I like to use the hand or the body because you always have that with you. And what we don't want to do is link you just to an external, like your essential lavender oil. And now you're on the road or at your competition and, oh my God, you forgot your essential oil. And now your anxiety is going through the roof because you don't have your anchor. Mm -hmm. You got your hands and you have your body. So it's body first. Uh, and then anything else you want to throw in there. Very interesting. Now, my brain's going to um, the possibility of getting rid of these these emotions. Like, is this something that we should assume when working through neurosculpting that eventually we can change the association altogether where it's gone? Or it, can we aim for that? What is your thought on that? Um, I like to level set expectations with my clients. So I rarely tell them that this will make anything go away. However, I am living testimony that it completely goes away. Mm -hmm. So I'll share my experience and I'll say, for me, I've had patterns soften and I've also had patterns completely go away. Here's why. A pattern is only there because it triggers a response in the body that was protective or helpful at some point in time. If you have uncoupled the body's response to that thought enough, that thought may never trigger the body again. So it's not like we're erasing memories, but it is possible in my case and in some of my clients to erase the pathway, to re-sculpt the pathway so that the memory no longer does anything to the body. And so in that way, it can feel like it goes away. My memory of my trauma, that didn't go away, but I don't have seizures that did. Um, and we do work with spinal cord injury and we have some case studies um, on my YouTube channel where um, we have a quad who was uh, subluxed at C3, partial sever, paralyzed from here down. Um, and I met her 13 years into her paralysis and we played with her identification story of I'm paralyzed, her belief I'm paralyzed. We played with the fact that her motor and sensory cortex has forgotten how to use hands and fingers and legs. And we played with these things. And uh, I have video of her moving her thumbs after 20 minutes. I have video of her using index and thumb after 13 years of paralysis, um, where the way her pattern hijacked her body, we interrupted that, shifted it, the memory and the reality is still there. She was thrown from a horse and she subluxed C3. I'm not going to change that. But what we did find was that there was some level of influence she actually did have over the motor movement of her fingers that she never would have had before if she allowed that old story to still talk to the body the same way. We had to interrupt how it spoke to the body. Um, so I've seen miracles happen. It's certainly not something I would want my clients to expect. Um, but truly, we create our reality from the inside out. Um, we 
influence our hormones. We influence our uh, inflammation, our the protein synthesis, the cellular functioning. We influence all of that through patterns and mind engagement. We know this to be true. We don't know exactly how it all works, but we know even we can epigenetically affect our lineage through environment nurture, the food we eat, the way we sleep. So there's so much that goes into the physical reality that I feel like there's just room for people who are willing to see where can I find agency. So you spoke about changing somebody's beliefs, and that's very interesting to me. So if we had someone who wanted to change some belief system in this demographic, let's say, hey, I've always been skinny and I want to be muscular, or hey, I've always been fat and I want to be lean, um, where would that begin? Would it be some type of regression back to uh, some type of stressful event that they're triggering to that belief? Or how would you begin that process? I actually have a client now who's got pretty much what you said and you know a bunch more um, where he did have a traumatic event that um, married itself to his body's buy-in that he would be too skinny, too small. Now there was a physical component because he was sick, but then there was a lot of the event itself um, hijacking him out of any other opportunity to believe differently because it was corroborated by you know, a bunch of specialists and then his family. And so he held it. And the truth is, I don't know if I'm going to get him to grow. But what I do know is that he can adjust. First of all, he can stop replaying that story um, on the screen of his mind as though it's happening now because it happened 11 years ago. So that's the first thing we do is we um, invite the nervous system to kind of put that story in the past by uncoupling from the momentary hijack. Then we look at, okay, why do you want to be taller? Why do you want to be bigger? Where does that come from? And do we have any influence over the why? Maybe that comes from, well, I don't feel like I'm enough. So I go let them work on I'm enough and cultivate that. And then over time, we can have them talk to their body. Maybe we can have them, you know, create a perception that they are activating their pituitary a little bit more robustly. We have them create perceptions where they're talking to their white blood cells. If it's a cancer person, I, I work with a lot of symptomatic people and some of them want to stay at that level. So we create stories for them that whether or not the story works, it's a better story. It's a more gentle, positive story for their inner landscape than the one that says, I'm not enough. I'll never be. And I'm, this is going to, you know, own me for the rest of my life. So the physical results are often the side effect of some of the deeper stuff that they start to excavate in exploring the physical symptoms. But I do work, we, I have a, a few cancer uh, clients who they just want to stay at the symptomatic level. So we work on imagining their white blood cells are more robust and battling, you know, the metastasis. Or we, we work on creative visualization around the actual physical stuff. And they find comfort in that. And their nervous system relaxes. And then, of course, all healing is supported by a regulated nervous system. So whether it's a very side door in or a direct door in, they start to feel a little bit better. And whether their test results match that or not, I don't know, but I certainly would rather go through an illness feeling like I had some influence over how I relate to that illness than going through the same illness feeling that I'm a victim to it because the victim story is just the one that dismantles us fastest. Amazing. What does your practice look like now for yourself? So maintaining this going forward. And, and obviously, if you're working one to one with a lot of people, there's probably a lot of emotional ups and downs in your life. And you're, you're probably exposed to some really interesting things, especially going deep into people's nervous system and psyche. I'd be curious how you kind of maintain such a high level of vibration and a high level of vitality. Yeah, I, I am doing I'm using my own tools 
all the time. I have amazing training. I have a lot of energetic training, metaphysical training to keep me in my boundaries, to keep me non-invasive. I don't, I do a really good job of prepping myself before a client where I'm going to hold a neutral space and listen and do what they need me to do versus my agenda and my empathy. Empathy is wonderful, but not in my practice. It's wonderful capacity to have in the world. But when I'm dealing with someone in trauma, I do not want to feel that because then I can't do what I need to do to support them. So I'm very clean uh, in my own practice. And then after every client, I literally stand up and shake. I bring in some neurogenic tremoring right away in case there's any part of me that started to contract and resonate and empathize. I need to get rid of that and I need to bring my nervous system back to regulation before the next client. So I have a shaking practice all day long. I'm doing vagal toning all day long with my face and, uh, and my neck. And then at the end of every day, I am encapsulating in a meditation my work and putting it outside of my space and bringing myself back into, I'm right here, I'm in the living room, I'm gonna eat dinner with my family. You know, I, I really do my work, a lot of my work. Um, so my private practice is full and it's a, I kind of work nonstop. So it's a Monday through Friday private practice with people all over the world. And then uh, at, uh, I run the Institute. So we're upgrading all of our content. We teach classes, live stream, weekends, immersions. Back when we could be in person, I was doing retreats all over the world. And, um, and then we just extended our reach. We, we just launched the Neuropraxis app which I'm super excited about. It's a it's an app of curated neurosculpting meditations for um, people dealing with biotoxic exposure, which at first was intended for like lime mold kind of scenarios, but now we've all been exposed to COVID. So it's really good for everybody where, you know, it's a library of meditations that you can go to when you're in an acute flare up and you can bring yourself back to regulation. And then beyond that, who am I now? Who am I post illness or weakness or sickness? Or, and who do I want to be? So that just launched. And so there's a lot of ways that we get the work out there. And we have about 60 practitioners who are out there doing this same thing in their communities. You mentioned you, that you shake and you do some of your vagal activities. And I don't want to assume that the listener knows why or what. So if you could walk us through that. Yeah. Um, shaking is my lifeline. And so anytime the nervous system is dysregulated, you're either moving to arousal, which is like, Ur, or you're moving to like parasympathetic freeze, which can be very rigid and contained. So there's this sense of contraction. And so you've got a brain state that triggers a muscle contracted state in the body. None of that's gonna change unless you do one of two things. You either change your brain state, so the muscles say, okay, I can relax now, or you change the muscle state so it can feed back to the brain. But instead, we just stay there. So shaking is a way to take the contraction in the muscles and dissipate, let them finish their contractive protective uh, process dissipate the charge. And when they're all fatigued and dissipated, they'll soften. And then they'll send a, a feedback signal to the brain that says, we're soft, we must be okay. So for me, or an animal in the wild, uh, or like your dog, when he or she hears a loud noise, will go shaking like, like that. That's neurogenic tremoring. It is the fastest way I know how to regulate it feels amazing when you're done. You don't have to have any formal training to just shake your body vigorously. Um, and the more convulsive it looks, probably the deeper you're getting. And so it's not pretty, it's awkward. So you might wanna do it in the bathroom. At least at first. Yeah, yeah. but it's an instant, instant regulation for my nervous system because I've been doing it so long. So that's the one thing. And then vagal toning, which is like a lifetime of study, but in two seconds, these muscles here and these muscles here 
speak very specifically. They innervate very magically the vagus nerve in the pons. So in this um, brainstem. So that means the state of your facial muscles is talking to your most primitive nervous system. So if your facial muscles are doing that or tight here or here or that was, that was my face as a teenager. You just got to see it. Um, you're telling your vagus system, I'm suspicious or I don't trust or the world is unsafe. So micro expressions in the face are actually speaking very loudly to the nervous system and throat as well. Tight throat does not help you regulate. So for me, in addition to shaking, I'm going to do jaw massage. I'm going to do lip trills like to soften all of this. And I'm going to do humming, singing and gargling for my throat so that I don't take the stress and contraction that I might have picked up in my private practice that's not mine and hold it. And I may even release some of my own by conditioning my vagus system. So those are easy somatic hacks that I really feel like, I feel like every human being should be doing them every day anyway. Totally agree. And I've started making my kids do that. We read a book, my daughter's seven, and we read a book where um, I was having a hard time getting her understanding the, the extended exhalations. So I was like, well, they're only, they're going, Phew. I was like three seconds. So the book said, get them to buzz like a bee or um, like like a snake. I was like, gosh, that's the best idea ever. So we've been doing that and then it evolves into something else. Uh, but it's a great way to get myself and them understanding a little bit of regulation. So we'll get them to do that stuff anytime there's Absolutely. any type of dysregulation. I think as much as I always refer back to my kids, there's relevance in that for adults too. Yeah. And, and another one that works really well with my children clients is blowing out candles on a cake. And I keep increasing the amount of candles they have to blow out. Like just in their imagination. In their imagination. Yeah. Or can they blow out an exhale that goes past the wall and blows the leaves of that tree and then the leaves of the tree past it? So these fun visuals work really well for kids. Hmm. That's great. Now that's not too much of a, like an abrupt fast exhalation. You're trying to get them to do a slow one. Does Long, it slow, sustained. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Lisa, this has been fantastic. And I think you're going to help so many people. I know you're already full, but I'm so grateful for you sharing this information. Yeah. Where can our listeners find more from you? Um, yeah. So um, Instagram is a great place. You can visit us at neurosculpting.institute. You can visit us at neuro.praxis. We actually um, have a coupon code if any of you want to try the app. It's BPAC Fitness. And you can go to um, neuropraxis.com for the web app, or you can just wait another couple days and we're going to be in the app store. Can you spell Praxis? Because I don't think it's typical. P-R-A-X-I-S. And you can go to neurosculptinginstitute.com and you can email us. We're super responsive. You can look at all of our classes and resources and... Um, are doing online classes? Like if I wanted to go, so I'm not going to say classes, but like I, I envision this as being you leading a group. Is that yeah. something you do or is it usually one-on-one? Yes. -on -one? Yeah. No, we do group work too. And um, we were light because of COVID, but we'll be back to regular programming so that on our events calendar, you could tune into live sessions, group sessions with uh, me and some of our other practitioners. Wonderful. So if anyone's in or near Denver, Colorado, you can go visit Lisa at yes, please. the facility and learn some of this great stuff. This is great. This is so empowering. And I, I love that you are uh, creating a unique, unique perspective, unique conversation, unique process, because so many people, you know, put so much clout behind PhDs and doctors and, and not to discredit anybody, but there's so much value in someone who has an incredibly apparent passion for what you do and going exponentially deeper than someone who just got a couple of letters, you know, before or after the name. And again, not to discredit anybody, but there's so much value in what you're teaching. So thank you so much for what you do and continue to do what you do. I'm sure it's going to continue to evolve and, and impact more people. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. You speak my language. So it was really fun to talk to you. Thanks, Lisa. That's a wrap, ladies and gents. As I said, she's awesome. She's very cool. And I hope each and every one of you got something incredibly valuable out of this. I think my big takeaway is start paying attention, right? Start paying attention to your body. Start paying attention to the way you breathe, the way you walk, and ultimately the way you meditate. Breathe, walk, meditate has become my trilogy for a reason because I think it's the most impactful things you can do for the human body. Meditation is ultimately training for your brain. So I suggest each and every one of you guys 
take up Palisa on her offer to teach you how to meditate in this neuro sculpting fashion. Uh, and don't forget to take care of our sponsors, realmushrooms.com slash Ben. We'll get you guys hooked up with 30% off with the highest quality mushrooms that I've been able to vet anywhere in the world. You know, I care about what goes into my body and so should you. The highest quality ingredients are so important. I don't want to be taking in things that aren't healthy. I certainly don't want to be putting in things that aren't supposed to be there. Ultimately, I don't want to be putting in pesticides and toxins that aren't supposed to be there. I'm sourcing out the highest quality ingredients for you and for me so we can live our greatest life in a body that we absolutely love. I'm so grateful that you're here. I'm so grateful for your time. I'm grateful to be back in uh, real life after my excursion away in the wilderness, which, by the way, was fantastic. And I will be telling you a lot more about that in future episodes. So don't forget to tune back in to the next episode as the, of the Muscle Intelligence Podcast and subscribe so you never miss a beat. Thanks, guys. Have an amazing day. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.